because I've been listening today to um, the speakers, uh, and I've been hearing about the importance of multilateral trade, about uh, uh, the work that we do in the UN, um, but nothing, um, but, but, but it is very clear to me that Australia is profoundly isolationist, exceptionalist, and indeed unique in the way in which we go about implementing our human rights law. Australia has been a good international citizen, um, and I'm hearing, we're hearing again about a, uh, an arms trade treaty. We've been a leader from those days of Doc Evatt, the, the rather testy, um, if brilliant man who uh, assured that the United Nations General Assembly, when he was president in 1948, passed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights without a single opposing vote. That was an extraordinary achievement for the time, and one that uh, uh, provided a foundation for the development of all the contemporary human rights treaty law that's been developed. And Australia has played, over the decades, a very significant role in developing that law. But the great tragedy has been that we have not implemented that law in Australian domestic law. Uh, we have no or very few charter provisions to protect human rights. We have no bill or charter of rights. We have not implemented the major treaties into Australian domestic law. Uh, and we have very little legislation that protects those rights. We have become seriously isolated from the jurisprudence of the uh, region, uh, sorry, of other regions, because we have no regional human rights treaty and we have no regional human rights courts, unlike obviously Europe, uh, Latin America, Africa, and more recently uh, the Middle East and Arab countries. Uh, we have no engagement in evolving jurisprudence as we ought to have. And when we do find that the United Nations bodies, the Human Rights uh, um, Committee, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, respectively, Nabi Pile, who's just left, and the new High Commissioner for Human Rights, they, they make formal complaints for the first time in history against Australia before the Human Rights Council, and those complaints and the findings and recommendations of the Human Rights Council are ignored. Now, that is an extraordinary phenomenon, and what it's done is to lead to the powerless environment in which we find ourselves today. Uh, we have just seen introduced into Parliament uh, amendments to the Migration and uh, Maritime Powers Act in which there is a specific clause that says that no act or authorisation under this legislation is to be invalid if it is in breach of Australia's international obligations and perhaps even worse, no act is to be invalid if it fails to meet uh, due process or na natural justice. So the entire body of international law and administrative law is excluded from the operation of that legislation. Uh, another example is the baby Farouz case decided just a few days ago where uh, a baby born in Australia is deemed under the Migration Act not to have been born in Australia but rather to have entered Australia by sea. Now, there are 170 babies born in immigration detention in the last 18 months and not one of those babies will be allowed to claim a protection visa because they are deemed as a matter of law uh, uh, Australian law to constitute uh, or to have fallen into the rule that they entered uh, Australia uh, by sea. Now clearly this child has been secretly hiding in his mother's womb for nine months to commit a criminal act in emerging in the Brisbane hospital and to claim, uh, in, um, uh, claim protection. These are shocking, shocking outcomes for Australia. What's the role of national human rights bodies? Well, um, our, body, our role is limited in Australia by uh, the practical imp implementation, and it is of all such bodies, because as, the, as our mandate is international human rights law, and as much of that law is not part of Australian law, it means that we have a great deal of difficulty in having traction on many of the issues. Um, one of the key aspects of national human rights bodies is their independence of government, their capacity to speak truth to power, um, and to uh, have positions which uh, are protected by statutory appointments by the equivalent of Governors General. Um, I think since I've been in this position, I've really understood the importance of national human rights bodies. Some of them are seriously under attack, as you may know, the Maldives have been uh, called before the Supreme Court for treason for criticising the government. It's a fairly extreme case, but mostly they are independent bodies that can speak truth to power, and they do. Um, they do all sorts of things. One of them is uh, to provide access to justice through the complaints mechanisms. Australia deal, we deal with 21,000 complaints a year. They don't go to the courts and they cannot go to the courts unless they come to us first. Um, but one of the very important 
aspects of the national human rights bodies is that we have a power to uh, uh, bring resolutions to the United Nations General Assembly and to work with the United Nations bodies in the Universal Periodic Review and to work with the monitoring bodies. So that we sit between civil society and NGOs on the one hand and government on the other. And we can provide a mechanism of getting hopefully a balanced and evidence-based view to the United Nations bodies in their reporting functions. So um, in the main, I certainly have to say it's true of Australia, uh, we are given genuine independence and we are respected. Um, but it, nonetheless, it's extremely difficult to achieve outcomes when we uh, do not have the relevant international covenant on civil and political rights, the rights of the child, are all not part of Australian law. Which brings me to the last point I wanted to make within my time, and that is that uh, we have a number of functions, the access to justice complaints, um, advocacy amongst the seven commissioners now, are part of the commission. Uh, but it's, uh, in February this year, I called an inquiry into Australia's asylum seeker policies as they relate to children in uh, detention. And as we speak, there are about 800 children still in uh, indefinite uh, closed detention, either on the Australian main mainland or in Christmas Island or Nauru. And we have been uh, looking at the uh, health and medical impacts on the children, and we hope to report uh, to Parliament within the next, it's gone to the printers, we hope it goes to Parliament within the next uh, couple of weeks if possible. And finally, may I say, uh, that I have spent a bit of time in Geneva recently at the request of the Human Rights High Commissioner to explain why Australia has such extraordinary policies in relation to asylum seekers and refugees, um, because they are genuinely mystified as to how a country that has been a leader in developing international human rights law should be taking the policy, exceptionalist policy view that it does. No other country in the world mandates the indefinite detention of children, in our case, on average, for more than one year and three months. And they are trying to come to grips with why this is the case. Now, if we want to get a seat on the Human Rights Council, we are going to have to take this matter into account and to um, uh, explain those ways in which we meet human rights standards. Um, and I was very pleased when I was in Geneva last that through the work of, of um, Peter Wilcock and, and the team there in Geneva, uh, the national human rights bodies did get a very important um, uh, resolution through into the General Assembly backed by 76 other states. And that um, is credit to the Department of Foreign Affairs in achieving that outcome for national human rights bodies. So they're exciting times, but I think we have to be realistic uh, that we cannot exclude human rights from the discussion of business or trade or security matters and defence. It's absolutely vital. And Australia uh, is being looked at askance in relation to our human rights uh, behaviour in the last few years. So I think it's time for people with your um, experience and influence to raise voices to say Australia can do a great deal better than it's doing at the moment. Thank you. Well, you've, you've asked a very big question. How do we break out from this isolationist um, route that, that we have undeniably have been taken in relation to human rights? And, and in fact, uh, Megan reminds me that our Prime Minister, when considering the constitutional possibility that we would add a clause in relation to the Race Discrimination Act, said we do not want that because that will be a mini Bill of Rights. Now, what is fascinating about that statement is that he knows that most Australians do not want a Bill of Rights or a Charter of Rights, because we have had so many senior politicians say that the last thing we need is some form of Charter of Rights, because then we would have an active judiciary that would start to make the laws for us. So this is the rhetoric. And I'm very interested that the Prime Minister had the confidence to say that, knowing that that would be the view of many Australians. But uh, unfortunately, uh, my, for me, my, my view is that we need to reopen the debate about having some benchmark uh, core fundamental human rights provisions. And I have a very recent reason for, for, for saying so. Uh, you'll all be aware of the debate on 18C. The uh, Prime Minister and the Attorney came to power in the pre-election period arguing very strongly that our rights to freedom of expression were seriously at risk by virtue of 18C that made it uh, an offence to offend, insult, harass and intimidate someone in the public arena on the grounds of their race. And that get, uh, had political suasion for nearly a year, uh, except that we had a, 
a public consultation, 5,500 submissions. Uh, they were not made public, um, which is curious in itself. But being Australians, it didn't take very long for a university to work out that most of those submissions would uh, agree to their submissions being in a public arena, so they went straight up on the website of that university. Um, but the, my point is that um, we do need uh, to think very seriously about, um, about what we mean by these rights, because within weeks of the Prime Minister announcing that we would no longer seek to amend the Race Discrimination Act, we have a raft of provisions, three new pieces of legislation introduced to Parliament on anti-terrorism laws, which seriously uh, impinge upon the right to freedom of speech, creating new offences in relation to advocacy of terrorism that we have never had before, quite different from the current provisions that exist under the, under the Criminal Code Act, because you don't need any longer to show a connection between advocacy and the Act, which has always been a classic requirement of criminal law. Uh, we also, of course, have the concerns that uh, if you were to divulge information, that would, uh, that would attract between five and ten years as a criminal offence, uh, even on the grounds of strict liability or recklessness. So what the point I'm making is that we're like a compass that's lost due north. We have no real concept of what our rights are, because we haven't got any jurisprudence developed in Australia as to what those rights are. However, I do concede that in putting an argument that we need to rethink about a, a, a Bill of Rights or a Charter of Rights of some sort. It's an uphill battle when leadership is so adamant that any form of Bill of Rights is not the Australian way. So what's the way out? Well, I think maybe in that quintessentially Australian way we're doing it uh, in a different series of, uh, we've got a different set of techniques. We've got a new parliamentary scrutiny committee which is proven to be quite effective. You'll notice that Dean Smith came up with a very interesting view about uh, two weeks ago, that the, uh, the, the, the that not to pay welfare uh, benefits to young people under 30, they've either got to earn or learn, uh, is contrary to the uh, International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Got him into a bit of trouble, but nonetheless, uh, that, that, that Parliamentary Scrutiny Committee is going to be an interesting one for the future. Sarah um, from the NIA. Um, Gillian, of course, it's troubling to hear that 800 children are still in detention. I'm assuming that they are in detention because they're with their parents. I, I assume they're not on their own. Right. Um, what, what, I, I just don't want, I'd like to know more about a solution for this. The reason that a lot of them are in detention is because they came on a boat with their, with their parents. If you change that and say, right, they're not going to go into, children will not go into detention, doesn't it make it easier for a parent to decide that I will travel with my child and therefore I will not have to go into detention because my child won't. I know that stopping the boats has been a controversial um, issue, uh, both Labour and or particularly the uh, Coalition has tried to stop this and has been fairly successful. Um, I mean there were people dying on boats, we had to take measures to stop this and I, I just think that, you know, children, maybe the rights of the child need, needs to be brought into this as well. Well, thank you very much for that question because, to be honest, that's the question that I'm most frequently asked when I go around uh, provincial Australia, big cities and so on, in, in talking about our inquiry. And the, the, the rhetoric that we, the, the public has, uh, has absorbed is that we've stopped the boats, we've stopped the dreadful drowns at sea, and we keep people detained. And the public has conflated the ideas on the, in the view that we need to keep children in detention because that's a way of stopping the boats and stopping the drowns. Now, in the inquiry that has now just been completed, we had five public hearings where people were came as witnesses on oath, and I have to say, uh, at my invitation, the former Minister for Immigration, um, Chris Bowen and the current Minister Scott Morrison came and gave evidence um, over questioning lasting about two hours for each of them and both of them agreed that holding children in prolonged detention was not a deterrent and that they didn't use it as a deterrent policy. And that is why I think we have to understand this, that, or rather ask the question, why are we detaining these children when it is not having, in their views, uh, a deterrent effect on people smuggling. 
Uh, now, that question has never been answered. Um, and one of the great difficulties at the moment is that we have 31,000 people in Australia whose claims to refugee status have not been assessed. Uh, that uh, occurred under the former government after the, after the 15th of July. We've had a freeze on assessments. But uh, one of the problems has been, according to one of the ministers, that were they, they were to release all of those that are currently detained, something like 6,000 people, uh, we, would, um, we would not be able to accommodate them and they would disappear into Australia and they would be out of control and we would never be able to control them. So they have, the government has not answered that question, but they have answered the question, no, uh, no, and that is children do not form part of the deterrent policy. Now, were it to form part of the deterrent policy, that would be grossly in breach of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. But that convention is not part of Australian law. So it's, it's, a, it's a powerless situation. Uh, the other point is that the end cannot justify the means. Even if it were a deterrent, we shouldn't be doing it. No. No, no, I, I mean, I, I, to talk about children as I do in the inquiry, is really code for saying that children and their families must be released. You, you clearly couldn't do one well without the other. We obviously concentrated on the impact of detention on children for strategic reasons. Here's one, of course, I absolutely agree. The social media is absolutely vital to, to, uh, to getting the story out about human rights, um, especially when you have the current situation in Australia where we have probably the greatest overreach of executive discretion that we've seen since Menzies tried to abolish the or outlaw the Communist Party. Uh, we've got a battle going on between the courts and the, and the government over offshore uh, asylum policy and refugee policy and that message is almost impossible to sell other than through the glib remarks that we get in the media. So we rely very heavily on the media. But of course it's, it's a dangerous and hot kitchen to get into mm -hmm. because once you place yourself into that environment to get your message across, you uh, can attract some very unattractive um, comment. Uh, and I uh, was watching or having breakfast with my husband one Sunday morning a few weeks ago and he put, I have no idea why, the bulk report on. And uh, I was enjoying my coffee in the cross room when I suddenly heard my name call. And uh, there was Bolt devoting the next 10 minutes of the program to why I should resign and the Australian Human Rights Commission should be completely abolished. So that has a powerful, powerful resonance with the Australian community. And that's very dangerous for us because we really can't afford that kind of comment. So uh, I've, I've, I need to use the media and I need to have the media understand what we're arguing. But it's very, very dangerous because they will play the man or the woman rather than the issue uh, when essentially they're dealing at an ideological level. Uh, I think the critical feature is something that we haven't really mentioned on that today really very much at all other than perhaps obliquely in, in the open session. And that is the absolutely vital importance of leadership to giving the right messages or what I would consider to be the right messages. The question was asked about our work as Australians in, in Africa and the Middle East. Australians will understand the need for that work uh, by Australia if the message is, is sold, if we, if, if we have leadership that presents those arguments. But when we have leadership that denigrates the, the, this work, then it's very easy for the Australian public to question why that work is, is taking place. Um, however, I do frankly think that we can be enormously influential in our own region, um, but nonetheless, Australians can be very quickly brought along on a humanitarian level, and with good leadership, they will understand why we need to help in Africa, particularly, I might add, as where our extractive industries in in Africa, and we need to protect our own reputation in, in working there. And Gillian Treats have talked about how we can contribute on human rights and international law, how we can be influential with the right leadership.